Well, good evening, uh, members of the public. I'm Steve McGraw. I'm the general manager for the San Mateo County Harbor District. This is the third in a series of meetings as the district moves from at-large elections to elections by district. The district has retained redistricting partners uh, to manage this process for us. And with that, <coughs> without further ado, I'll introduce Paul Mitchell with redistricting partners to lead us through our presentation this evening. Paul, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to be talking about redistricting uh, and the conversion from an at-large election system to a districted election system uh, under the California Voting Rights Act. First off, some definitions. Districting is the process of taking the at-large area covered by the Harbor District, in this case, and breaking it up into equal pieces for the purposes of elections. And it, is, it doesn't have any function beyond the election. It doesn't change the governance of the body. It doesn't mean that uh, certain facilities get you know, one kind of treatment and other facilities get a different kind of treatment based on what district they're in. These are solely districts for the purposes of electing members. Redistricting is the process of redrawing these lines generally every 10 years after the decennial census. Uh, the process of redistricting has become really polarized and what we'll talk about today are the steps that we're going to take to acknowledge how redistricting is used but also make sure we're using the proper principles to uh, draw lines that are fair and avoid the term that we all know which is gerrymandering. The gerrymandering term is essentially what everybody who went to high school in America learns about redistricting, and usually not much more than this one term. The term actually was named after Governor Gary, so technically it's called gerrymandering, uh, and it was based on a redistricting that essentially looked like a dragon or a salamander, uh, and uh, you know is parodied in a political cartoon. This is old timey. You know, this is hundreds of years ago, essentially. Uh, but uh, if you look at the last districting that the legislature did, they managed to draw this. This is the district that's currently held by Ken, Kevin De Leon, uh, state senator, or the one he was originally elected into. And it looks a lot like the original gerrymander. Um, if you get to a little more advanced analysis of redistricting, oftentimes you'll see a graphic like this that sets up this fictional area of Democrats and Republicans living together. But in this fictional area, Democrats have a small majority, and so you would expect in the normal course of events, they would elect more Democrats than Republicans. And that's what would happen if you drew districts like this, where now you take this area and you draw two districts that are more rep Democratic and one district, that's re one district that's Republican. Another way, though, if you wanted to get cute with it, would be to draw districts like this. And now you've taken that same area and created now two Republican districts and one Democratic district. That would be considered a, a partisan gerrymander. Oftentimes in local government, we don't see gerrymanders based on partisanship. We don't even see partisanship as commonly used in a criteria when doing local districting. In local districting, it's less about partisan politics and more about the urban versus the rural or the you know, the side that deals with, that has the, the college campus versus the side that is the older residents. Uh, I've worked in places all around the state with all kinds of different unique ways in which the district kind of divided itself and the way that uh, local government viewed itself and how districts were drawn was based on those kind of communities of interest. So it's not, we won't talk in the redistricting that we do, I don't believe, about Democrats and Republicans what we will likely talk about are other communities of interest and how they lay out in the district. When we draw districts, one of the things we try to do to reduce the opportunity for gerrymandering is follow some set principles that have been reinforced by Supreme Court decisions and by uh, state and federal policy. The first criteria we use is that districts should be relatively equal size. What this means is that each district is going to have an equal population. There will be five districts. Hi, come on in. 
This isn't overly formal, so. You can grab a presentation. So districts will be equal size. This doesn't mean that they're going to be equal size in terms of geography or square miles. What it means is they're going to be equal size in terms of the raw population based on the U.S. Census. We're going to use the 2010 decennial census as the determining number for population. Districts are going to be contiguous. And contiguous means that they're going to be whole pieces. They're not going to be a little bit here, a little bit there. They're going to be whole parts. Believe it or not, I've worked in redistricting local government in California where we've actually found districts where a district would start in one part and then kind of disappear and then pop up somewhere else. Uh, that's generally a sign that somebody was doing something fishy when they drew those district lines. We're not going to do that. We're going to maintain communities of interest. And communities of interest is, is kind of a term of art. Some people like to shorten it and call it koi, like a koi fish or a koi pond. But communities of interest come in different kind of grades. Kind of the A grade of a community of interest would be those that are determined to be protected classes under federal law. And when we talk about protected classes, we're talking about ethnic minorities, religious minorities. It can even be gender, sexual orientation, other kind of protected classes under federal law. A secondary criteria we might see, or like grade B in terms of communities of interest, are communities as they view themselves based on the workforce, based on the population that's living there, maybe a senior citizen center or maybe a college student town like we were talking about earlier. Uh, it could even be areas that share a similar environmental concern or environmental interest. As an example, when I was doing redistricting in Pasadena, there's this whole corridor right through the middle of Pasadena and all they care about is the extension of the 710 freeway. So their issue was a transportation issue. And when they drew districts, they were adamant that they all wanted to be kept together as a community of interest, instead of having their interest be divided into different council districts. Uh, another example would be homeowners versus renters. Um, this is actually percolating up as a very major issue in the state when we talk about uh, a statewide ballot measure on rent control and lots of local ballot measures on rent control and issues surrounding the differences in, in communities of interest for uh, multifamily units and single family homes. <coughs> Following city and council local government lines is another criteria. This is one that is codified in the state uh, redistricting law when it comes to drawing congressional and legislative districts. The state redistricting commission had a directive to follow certain criteria, and this was placed in the law as one of the criteria for them to follow. They actually didn't follow it perfectly, but when there were decisions to be made, there were kind of, kind of coin flip decisions, they would fall back onto trying to maintain county, city, local government lines. And this is something that we could choose, choose to do as well, which is follow an existing boundary as a way that existing boundaries are there for a reason. It's possible that the reason was 100 years ago. It's possible that the reason was last year. But there's some kind of reason that they created a boundary of a city line or maybe some kind of reason they created a boundary of a congressional district that was drawn by the State Redistricting Commission or a boundary that they drew for something else. So there's a reason to have, there's lines there. It's kind of like why not use them as kind of guideposts. A final kind of primary criteria in good redistricting is to keep districts compact. Now compact doesn't mean just small because obviously when we look at the districts, there are going to be areas that are very sparse, sparsely populated, and those districts are going to be very large. What compact means, and all the mathematical formulas around compactness and redistricting, basically speak to keeping things more as circles and squares, and less as squiggly lines and serpents and snakes and weird shapes. So compact isn't the same kind of thing that you're thinking about in like a layperson term of compact, meaning like small, but compact meaning a uh, shape that is keeping the district as small as possible given the square area that it has to fill. The California Voting Rights Act is rather new. Um, it's been around in California for 18 years, but the, it's a much newer than the federal law, and its implementation in the state has been really ramped up in the last several years. What 
it has done is it has changed uh, the criteria by which somebody would have to convert to districts, and it changes a lot of laws around that. So first off, any agency or city or county that is considered at large, as long as they don't elect individual members by individual district, that's the definition of at large in CDRA. You cannot have at large <coughs> elections under the California Voting Rights Act if you have racially polarized voting. This is a term that was put into the state law, but hasn't necessarily followed the same definition of the term federally. Racially polarized voting in California under the CVRA means that you have different groups that are voting differently on issues or candidates based on their ethnicity, and it can be proven with math. And uh, at the federal law, there's, it has to have more than that. The federal law doesn't just have to have individual groups voting differently based on ethnicity, um, but it also has to have proof that it's changing outcomes. So the federal law is outcome based. Something can be, people can be voting differently based on race all day long under the federal law, and it doesn't actually trigger a racially polarized voting claim unless you can prove a, a change in outcomes based on those, that ethnic voting. Um, but state law liberalizes it. Other ways in which the state law changes from federal law have to do with, um, first off, under which cases you would implement a districting under federal or state law. Under federal law, you cannot have these at-large seats, and you have to convert to districts if you can create a district wherein that minority group, the protected class, can, can, can be, you know, compose 50% or more of a district. So federal law, the only, dist only places where you have to go from at-large to districted are where you can create majority-minority districts. State law says that you have to convert if that minority community can influence the outcome of an election. So federal law, Majority minority, it's a real easy math problem. You know, it's basically can you get a district to be 50% of one ethnicity? State law, forget the percentage of ethnicity. Can a district be influenced? Can an election be influenced by that minority group in the districted system? And depending on where you look, the courts have uh, approved district boundaries where an ethnic minority group might be 17, 18, 19, 20, 25% of a district. So there's not the strict math under the California law, which makes it a lot easier to bring one of these claims. The second thing that makes it a lot easier to bring one of these claims is that under federal law, you can have a court case that goes for years through the federal courts, and maybe at the end, as an attorney, you're going to get some kind of financial reimbursement. Maybe you'll get the plaintiff, as a plaintiff, be able to obtain essentially damages. However, uh, in the state law, you're guaranteed this money as an attorney. So. It's a very different uh, setup under the state law. It essentially liberalizes the way in which the law is being interpreted and then gives a little bit of a sweetener to plaintiff attorneys to bring cases. And that has really ramped up the number of cases that we've seen. Here are some examples of some rather costly battles that have been waged. And this is only the payments that were made by the, the agency being sued. After they complied with the districting process under the CVRA, then they had to pay these levels of damages to the plaintiff's attorneys, and that doesn't even count the attorney's fees they were paying for their own attorneys, and we know attorneys can be expensive, right? Nobody wants to pay more for attorneys. Um, so when we look at uh, converting to this districted system, a lot of things that we look at are the the places where we might have convert, uh, concentrations of the minority subgroups, where we might have racially polarized voting, and if the, district, if the districting process will help empower these communities. So as we're drawing these districts, we'll think about these things. We'll think about drawing the districts in a way wherein if there is a dense Asian population or Latino population or even an LGBT population or a population that has a certain environmental interest, whether we're going to be drawing these districts in a way where they can effectively uh, influence the outcome of an election. That's essentially the point of this. 
When we look at the district, we turn off the lights. When we look at the district, we see a, a, an overall population of roughly three quarters of a million uh, based on the 2010 census. That means three quarters of a million uh, residents of the district laid their head on a pillow April 1st, 2010. If we take that three quarters of a million population and we were to break that up into uh, five districts of roughly equal population, we're looking at each district comprising around 144,000, I believe, uh, residents. And now when I say residents, I'm talking human beings. This isn't registered voters. This isn't citizens. This isn't over 18. This is literally any human being living within the boundaries of the district. However, we're if we were drawing congressional districts here, we would draw all these districts to be almost exactly the same number, literally to a person. In the state redistricting process, when they draw congressional lines, they draw them to a one-person deviation, meaning no district is more than one person larger than the, the next district. And that's true in all states in the United States except for Hawaii. Um, and since we don't have the screen, I'll tell the, the Hawaii story. <laughs> in Hawaii, uh, they tried drawing districts where each district was equal population to one person, like the rest of the country. But that created the situation where you'd have an island that would start a district, and then it would have to like go to another island and be the other part of the district. And they called them canoe districts, meaning that the way you could get from one end of the district to the other was only via canoe. Um, hey, I got that right. So the uh, the if we do a deviation that's more appropriate for local government, rather than doing the one person deviation, we'll accept as like a guideline that we don't want a, one district to be more than 5% larger than the next district. In terms of actual population, that comes to a range of about 140 to 147,000 in terms of the smallest district to the largest district. So these are still pretty large districts. When we look at the cities that are in the district, and you can actually see them all on this map, really well and so after the presentation if you wanted to you can look here to see really good kind of outlines of these districts we see several districts that are several cities that are fairly large and when we think about that 140,000 range you can see you know a daily city is about three quarters of the way there a little more than three quarters of the way there uh, same thing with San Mateo uh, we have some rather large cities that in some of these you can tell are kind of like right neighboring to each other so we might find you know, a pair of cities that almost gets you to that 140,000 right away. We also have communities that are recognized by the census, and there's two types. There are unincorporated communities and towns. Some of these towns might have city councils and might have other ways in which they're incorporated, and then these unincorporated areas here are ways in which people identify. They'll say, I live in La Honda, and their address on their mailing label will say La Honda, but there isn't like a city council that they vote for. They don't get municipal services. There's no La Honda Police Department. And so they are unincorporated areas, and there might be a, an example of a reason why in some redistricting, say we were doing a countywide redistricting, we might want to make sure that unincorporated areas were more grouped together because they might have a similar interest, whereas incorporated areas might want to be more grouped together because they would have a similar interest. And that speaks to how districting for different agencies can also be very different. I've drawn, in the same area of Los Angeles, I've drawn community college districts where we were looking at making sure that every community college, that every board seat had a community college district, a community college campus in it. I've drawn school districts where the issues were about where were the concentrations of children based on the US Census calculations. I've drawn water districts based on not only the underlying water agency that provides the service under the water district area, but also the agriculture. So is some place being used by commercial water? Is it being used residential water? Is it being used agricultural water? And so whenever we draw districts, we think about these in the communities of interest and how the area lays out based on the agency. So as an example, if we were drawing districts for the county or if we were drawing districts for a congressional district, we might really focus on this. But then I'm going to have to hear from the board and the community whether these, these kind of geographies are really as important or if there are other geographies or transportation issues or other things that are going to be more driving factors. 
the densities of the population is also another really interesting thing I think about doing districts in this in this county um, so we have densities of Asian and Latino populations in the county uh, and if you look at these maps that we have in the presentation you can see essentially some rather strong concentrations up here uh, in, around San Bruno, South San Francisco, and then some other sm strong uh, in uh, uh, you know this eastern uh, southeastern portion of the district. The we also have in this North Fair Oaks. Actually, we'll get to that in the next. That's Asian. In Latinos, we have a real strong concentration in this North Fair Oaks community. <coughs> we have something like this, and these will pop up every once in a while. This area right here shows as being really strongly Latino. That's based on percentage, and it's based on this census block group. What I would guess is that this is probably, you know, a couple hundred voter, a couple hundred residents, and it just happens that you know, thirty of them are Latino, so it looks really strong. That this isn't going to be as important of a driving factor in drawing essentially like a Latino district as North Fair Oaks, where in my experience this is a very dense Latino population. The density also is not just based on kind of the ethnic density and where that is placed, but also on the actual raw population density with this strong density right along the 101-280 corridor. And I find this to be very interesting. You can see the denser is the darker colored areas, the denser population just right down here with very low or essentially you know, non-existent density in the more rural areas and along the west coast here. So we, uh, we have a situation essentially where we have rather large areas with very few people in which to draw a district and other areas that are extremely dense. So like here in East Palo Alto or coming up here through North Bear Oaks, that density there. Um, you know, you have this, this essentially a situation where while I haven't drawn lines yet, if I drew lines and they went one, two, three, four, and then five, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. You know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised for all of this large swath of more rural area with low density to all be in one district. So that's something that we'll have to discuss as we start drawing lines. The next steps are essentially to reach out to the community. That's what we're doing these with these meetings. Um, we want to hear about communities of interest. We want to hear from either board members or the public how they interact with the Harbor District, what are their communities of interest, you know, what essentially makes them, uh, how, when they're interacting with the agency or when they're interacting with issues around the agency, what is it really that they're touching? As an example, is it about environmental issues? Is it about transportation issues? Is it about representation on you know, certain issues that come before the agency or that come before other governmental agencies? Is it about, um, you know, what, what are the real driving factors? It's a lot easier if I walk into an area and I know where the campuses of a school are. Or if I walk into an area and I know, um, you know, the college district and where the college campuses are. But in this kind of a situation, we do have two harbors and I know that we do have some land owned by the district, but beyond that, we're really looking for what are the communities of interest that can be utilized in a districting process. Um, I have not drawn maps yet, but now our plan is to have three public hearings. This is the third public hearing. And after the third public hearing, I'm gonna start drawing maps. At the next hearing, which will be an actual board meeting, we're gonna have maps already available and on the website they will have been on the website for a week by the time we have the next public meeting. And those maps will incorporate any feedback that I get and also just my experience doing districting uh, in the past to provide the district with a sense of options. Additionally, if anybody does contact the district to uh, kind of alert us to a community of interest or if at any of the board meetings people talk about community of interest, then I'm gonna try to incorporate that in the line drawing process and if we're so lucky as to get a number of different maps from the public or different ideas for district boundaries, I'll do my best to analyze those and make sure that those are uh, available and I can speak to all of those 
when we do have the next meeting. Um, and with that, hand it back over. Unless well, people have questions, I don't know if Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, you know, I was going to reiterate what you said about the three meetings, the next meeting, August the 15th at 6.30. Um, at the Harbor District offices in El Granada, uh, 504 uh, Alhambra, uh, Suite 200. Uh, Paul will be there with the maps, but with that, certainly if there are any questions from the public, Paul will be happy to entertain. Any questions? Yes, how yeah. we just came, the district came from the Harbor District, because it's really Harbor served, you know, Harbor entity. So how is that going to help the people? How does it help? Uh -huh. So the, essentially, the, it doesn't have like a direct help to the district in terms of its day-to-day -day work or its governance or its, or you know, how it performs the functions of the Harbor District. It only has an impact in how the board is elected. And so to back up, we have essentially in the state flip-flopped. When the state was first forming local governments and first forming cities in kind of the progressive era in California, they were creating all these at-large entities. So like city councils were being elected at-large and county boards of supervisors were being elected at-large. Um, and the idea was at the time that on the East Coast they had all these ward systems with ward bosses and patronage and all these problems and corruption that were born out of, say, Chicago being broken up into 15 districts, and each of the districts had essentially like a political boss there that would pay people off for votes and then hand out jobs to their friends. That negative view of kind of the districted system, the ward system, caused in California most cities to be electing at large. Even very large cities were being elected at large. And that was the progressive reform to try to get rid of political corruption. Fast forward, you know, a hundred years, two hundred years or whatever, fast forward a long period of time, and California started recognizing a different problem. And that different problem that recognized, and this might not be true in your agency, this might not be true in the county, but it's true in many parts of the state. What it recognized was that you would have pockets of ethnic communities like these, where maybe this was the West Covina City Council, Maybe this is the LA Unified School District. Maybe this is the city of Anaheim. Where in the city of Anaheim, West Covina, and other areas, the urban areas that arguably had some of the greatest issues couldn't elect anybody to the city council, couldn't elect anybody to any offices, because in the at-large election system, the vast majority of white voters would essentially have a lock on all of the races. So they would elect you know, in West Covina, the joke was that you could run a 5K around all the homes of all the city council members in West Covina. They all lived on the hillside. They all lived in the same community. Same thing in Anaheim. All the city council members in Anaheim all lived in the, in the hillsides, all lived in the white community. And so the idea of districting was we're now going to tip the scale the other direction. The state decided they're going to tip the scale with the California Voting Rights Act into a direction where if you have racially polarized voting in a, in a community, you have to draw districts that would allow for you know, the ethnic community to have a stronger voice and to elect a candidate of their own choice. That you couldn't have an at-large election system where their, where their voices and their, their candidates of choice could be outvoted by the majority. Now, this county underwent a huge and very expensive districting process under the California Voting Rights Act a few years ago. It was actually the very last county to convert to district elections. And in that process, they went through an extensive racially polarized voting analysis, which found that there is racially polarized voting within the county, particularly among Asians and secondarily among Latinos. And then even among Asians, as we were talking about in a prior hearing, there is different communities within the Asian community that might be voting racially polarized as well. So piggybacking essentially on the county's work, we don't need to do a lot of investigation as to whether or not this jurisdiction would fall under the California Voting Rights Act and would be seen to have racially polarized voting. But what we do know is that you've been essentially served letters by two different attorneys. Isn't that right? Yes. 
And each of those two different attorneys are claiming a CVRA, they're making a CVRA claim, and they're saying, you have to follow this process under state law, which we're now engaging in, and convert to districted lines, or we can sue you for an unlimited amount of money. So, from what I understand, the attorneys that file this, they're not even from this community. They're well, from probably. from Southern California. This is what... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, what was their interest to... to why not attorneys from our local areas that are familiar with the makeup of this district and... The state they, law... What I, when we went through the federal law, it was really hard to sue under federal law. And the state law really liberalized it. They made it very easy for any attorney to go in and, and file a claim. They even just, they just had to file a letter saying they're going to sue to get this process started. And uh, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a local attorney. It doesn't have to be somebody who's witnessed a problem at the district. And it doesn't have to have those kind of elements. Um, you know, it's just the way that the law has been done. And so there are certain attorneys that have focused on their business on this. Kim, did you want to speak to this? You have to have a client, though, that lives in the district. That, that's what so I'm the, the, where the attorney is from is immature. Correct. Right. Correct. So they have a, a party that has gone to them. Where, where is this party from? What is, what is their cause? What is their payoff? There has to be something that... Hmm? It's a business model. I, no, I understand, but I'm trying to, not that I'm against it, I'm trying to understand the benefit analysis of how is this going to help our community. Did we, in fact, yes, you're talking about the concentration areas, if you're talking about fire service, water service, there's direct impact. Harbor District is very unique kind of a service that is really does not apply per se to one particular religious community or to one particular racial. If you are a boat owner, if you are a fisherman, you can go to any of those harbors. And so I'm trying to understand what was the reason and how is that going to help this unique service that we provide, having a harbor district. Well, it Which minority group has been damaged by having the current system? What's interesting is when you speak about it like that, the state law doesn't require you to show that, there was, that any community was damaged. Mm -hmm. It requires you to show that you're in an area that has racially polarized voting. So I don't argue, I'm not going to stand up here and say that this is going to improve the services that the Harbor District performs or that it's going to make for better harbors. But what I am going to be able to say is that this would allow the district to avoid extremely costly litigation if they chose not to convert to districts. And what we're trying to do is implement a process as, as easily as possible and as cleanly for the district so that you get out of this situation, you know, with as, the minimum cost associated with it. Right. It's, it's what I'm really trying to understand. And once I understand, I would have very little confusion. Um, in Brisbane, mm -hmm. Three out of the five council members live in the same street. Mm -hmm. So could that be a cause for alarm that, hey, three council members live on King's Road, therefore there is some problem, we need to go take care of this and change the whole system of election and that because three council members are, in, are elected from the same street. So under federal law, Let's say you had a federal lawsuit and you're trying to prove that there was harm being done by the, the, the at-large election system. You're trying to prove that the racial composition of the district and the inability of communities of interest to elect candidates of choice was having a negative outcome. You could use something like that as evidence in a federal lawsuit where you have to prove harm. In a state lawsuit, you don't have to prove harm. And uh, so it doesn't really do you a lot of benefit to show that three people live on the same street. Um, all you have to prove in a state lawsuit is 
that there's racially polarized voting, and I haven't done any, a racially polarized voting analysis of Brisbane. I've done one of Redwood City. I've done one of different communities around the area, but not of Brisbane myself. But I yet. doubt that you would find any racially Maybe not. Polarized. I've worked on some stuff on the other side of the bay um, and found communities that don't have racially polarized voting. It's so, The other thing that I was asked, why do we want to immediately get afraid of fear of being sued, therefore, oh, let's just do whatever that special interest that contacted the attorney, let's jump and sue to avoid lawsuit, um, rather than looking at the merits and benefits uh, for this harbor district. Again, I understand, but yeah. are we jumping in because, oh, there's a threat of lawsuit, let's just... I can maybe Kim is better at suited dances, but I'll tell you what my viewpoint usually is. I view this in a family of different things that the state law has imposed upon local agencies, mm -hmm. like the Brown Act mm -hmm. or ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. And in ADA compliance, Brown Act, and the CVRA, my view is that even if somebody doesn't believe that a handicapped person is coming to their business, or doesn't believe that the Brown Act would be, you know, impacting or benefiting their agency they still have to follow those laws because to not follow those laws puts you in essentially harm's way. The, this, this conversion to district lines is, in every other agency I've worked in, been called, it's been called a safe harbor. So there's this safe, safe harbor of following this particular process, and it becomes a pun working here, but um, <laughs> and there's a safe harbor of following this process to, uh, to convert to district lines I would argue there's no harm to having districted line system versus the at-large election system as well. And in doing so, it helps you avoid potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in, in lawsuits. I have one yeah. more question, Um As you know, in counties, Amateur County, we did a district. Mm -hmm. um, one of our colleagues ran for the Board of Supervisors. In the past, Brisbane had a very hard time to have qualified candidates to run for the cap for a board of supervisors because big cities would you know pack mm -hmm. in the little cities. It didn't help Brisbane at all. We had a candidate after redistricting that ran for the board of supervisor. Again, big cities like Daly City grabbed it. Mm -hmm. it was exactly like it was before redistricting. Mm -hmm. So would you tell me yeah, so uh, it's important to note that this process is not outcome-based either. So when we draw this district lines, if we're drawing district lines, let's say just theoretically we're drawing district lines in, in uh, Los Angeles, and we drew a downtown district. If somebody doesn't get elected from the downtown area, that doesn't mean that somebody that, that you can come back and claim that the districting didn't work. Um, so they're not necessarily outcome-based, even though you didn't see somebody get elected from Brisbane, that wouldn't be a basis to say that there was a failure in the district lines. The second thing is, you'd have to do a lot of really deep analysis to really dig into what were the candidates of choice within those communities in Brisbane and the other areas to define whether or not that geography in the district or racially polarized voting within the district caused one candidate to win or the other. Um, and you know, finally, redistricting doesn't necessarily solve everything. I mean, if somebody's viewpoint was that they were going to uh, draw district lines so that somebody from La Honda could win an election, I'm sorry, but La Honda might just not have enough people to be a strong enough voting block to elect somebody to office in a districted system even with five seats. So, you know, there's, there's not, we're not seeking perfect outcomes. What we're seeking is better inputs. We're seeking a system where the district lines are drawn in a way and the elections conducted in a way where there isn't a, a broad infrastructure that disenfranchises certain communities. And, um, but that doesn't mean that it's a failure if it doesn't perfectly elect people from those communities, if you know what I'm saying. Thank you. And there have also been situations where districting happens and then nobody runs from that area. Like in Woodland, they did a redistricting the south part of Woodland under Main Street that had never elected anybody to office, under the first election, nobody ran. And they, they claimed like, oh, this is a failure of the redistricting process. However, the argument is that over time, 
people will start in that community to realize that they have an opportunity to engage, an opportunity to win offices, and to, you know, over time get somebody elected. Um, so most importantly, we, we're going to follow these principles of redistricting, follow good redistricting practices to draw the best lines we can, given the data that we have, and, um, you know, it, it, it's success or failure isn't going to be judged by the outcome of one or even two election cycles or anything. So, yeah. Kim, did you have anything you wanted to add? Thank you, sir. <coughs> All right, well, thank you very much for coming. Steve, thank you for having me here again. Well, once again, thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll be seeing you again on August the 15th yep. at the Board of Commissioners meeting with in, maps. in El Granada with maps, which will be up and online and available at least a week prior. All right. so Thanks very much. This is the last public meeting before the maps are drawn. Yeah, pre right? And then, and thank you for that. I'd like to recognize uh, the president of our Board of Commissioners, Virginia Chancarelli, and the board here in the meeting here. and. Uh, that's absolutely correct. There will be the meeting with the maps. Then with the will be, as Paul said earlier, some other meetings after that. Those will be yeah. adequately publicized as well prior to the eventual meeting of the Board of Commissioners in September where the Board will select the final map and the process of implementing that map over the next couple of elections, not including the November of 2018. All right. That's correct. Just to be clear, this is not for this November Correct. Election. That is correct. 2020 and 2022 yeah. will be the elections that implement the results of this process. Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good to see you again.